I was looking at my old notes for the class that I taught. I taught a class, I don't know when it was, a long time ago, called Electra's, because this story of um, Electra and uh, Orestes coming together and murdering their mother uh, is the only story, these, there are three tragedies extant. This one, Sophocles, Electra, and, uh, and Euripides, Electra, that are about the same story. They're very, very different, but they're, um, they're about the same story. And I, I once taught a, taught a course in which I only read the three plays. Um, so I have notes that run to, you know, it was a seminar, so met once a week. And I have, I think, four, three hour, five, three hour classes on, on this play. Um, and we're doing it in four and a half hours, the whole thing. So do the math. I mean, we, we're leaving a lot out. Um, I'm only talking about what I understand. We don't really know. We know at the end of the libation bears that um, Orestes says he's going to the navel of the world, which is Delphi. He's going to Apollo's Oracle at Delphi. And the humanities opens with Orestes um, at, in, in Apollo's temple at Delphi. So from one point of view, you could say, well, he, you know, it follows pretty directly as fast as he could get there, a couple of days maybe, something like that. On the other hand, it doesn't have to be that. He certainly gives the impression that he's been chased all over Greece and finally ends up at the, the temple at Delphi. So I think that what's interesting about that, I learned this when I started reading Plato. You occasionally run into problems. You're beating your head against a wall and you can say, how can that be? That doesn't make any sense. I don't see how, when, when you run into a problem that you can't solve, it's worth, a, it's worth asking yourself, is it supposed to be indeterminate? What happens if I assume that this lack of information? So in Plato, for example, um, it opens with a, this is the, the dialogue about the death of Socrates. Uh, the, he's in prison, he takes the poison, he's surrounded by his young followers. Um, but that's actually not the setting of the dialogue. The setting is, it's a conversation between Phaedo, one of the people who was at the death of Socrates, and a man from Phleas called Echecrates. Um, and you figure out pretty quickly when you start to read the dialogue, Echecrates says to Phaedo, oh, can't you tell me about what they did and what they said on the last day of Socrates' life? Um, and then Phaedo proceeds to narrate an account of the dialogue um, that took place. You figure out pretty quickly that um, you can't, you don't know how, many, how much time has elapsed between Socrates' death and the recounting of Socrates' death. And then you figure out also pretty quickly, you don't even know where this is. The fact that Echecrates is from Phleas doesn't mean they're, in, they're at Phleas. I mean, it could be anywhere. So then you, 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 you could try to solve that problem, what classical scholars frequently do is they, you know, they try desperately to figure out why it has to be one place. Or, but in fact, if you entertain the possibility that the time and the place are indeterminate, then you see that Plato's forcing you to ask the question, why am I reading about Socrates in 2018 in Bronxville? What does it mean that the time and place are indeterminate? It has something to do, since the dialogue turns out to be about, um, about the possibility of an afterlife. It looks as though the Socratic afterlife is not only 30 years later or five years later or 15 minutes later in Phleas, but also several thousand years later in Bronxville. And that comes up as soon as you realize what it means that time and place are intentionally indeterminate. So I'm not sure that that's true of the relation between the libation bearers and the humanities, but it's an interesting thought.
it's worth thinking about. I mean, time turns out to be the great question. Well, it's not the great question. Whenever I say it's the great question, it means it's a great question. <laughs> but it's the great question about justice. Because, I mean, what we've seen is that part of the difficulty with justice is for it to be perfect, it would have to completely make up not only for the original, it's not only an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it's the toothache that you need to, you need to, so, so you need to, you need to solve the problem of, of the interval between the unjust deed and whatever is done to make up for it. Time makes it very difficult because you say to yourself, well, the perfectly just response, if God were in charge, if Zeus were in charge rather than Orestes would be, as soon as the injustice was done, there'd be a bolt of um, lightning from heaven. To, but in fact, even that gives you an interval, even that gives, so it would have to happen in a way before it happened. I'm sorry? Yeah, in which case there wouldn't be an act of injustice and there wouldn't be anything to, so that's meant, it, this comes out, this comes out in this play, it comes out really with a, with a we won't read Sophocles' Electra, but it's one of the great themes of, of that play. Um, okay, uh, what do we got? Um, well, the first thing is you should read through all of the humanities for next time, and then we're gonna spend more time on the humanities. So um, go back and I would say concentrate on the first 179 lines. That's what we'll do next time. I think we'll spend at least four days on, on this play. Um, okay. So if we're gonna understand the libation bearers, we would have to figure out what it means that Orestes goes crazy at the end of the play. Um, now, we know that the issue of the trilogy is in some way justice. The question of justice is in some obvious everyday way connected to the question of madness. Um, Think about the way we talk about the most extreme crimes. He must have been crazy, we say. That in some way means that doing an injustice means losing touch with reality. Injustice is in a way like unreality or the just is connected to the way things are, to being. The just, to dikaion, is connected to to on, to being. Um, now, I, I want to, I want you to keep that in mind. I want to circle back on this issue by looking at four different passages in the play today. So, if we go back to the beginning, um, what do we have? The play opens with Orestes observing the chorus and his sister uh, bringing a libation to his father's tomb. Now, at line 16, Orestes thinks he can identify Electra because her grief is said to be conspicuous. It's not quite the translation you have, but you'll recognize the line. Hers is conspicuous and the implication is that the rest of them, the chorus, uh, their grief is not conspicuous. Now, Orestes turns out to be wrong. Um, it turn, if you look at page 135, um, so on 133 he says, top of the page, uh, or shall I be right if I guess that they are bringing libations uh, to the Father? meant to appease those uh, below the earth. It can be nothing else, yes, I seem to see in advance, Electra, my sister, conspicuous for her bitter grief. 
O oh, Zeus, grant that I may avenge the death, and so on. And then two pages later, the chorus, bottom of the page on 235, 135, say, but as for me, since a constraint that beset my city has been laid on me by the gods, for from the house of my father they led me to a fate of servitude, things just and things unjust, um, must I approve, mastering the bitter repugnance that is in my mind. So it's not that they don't feel grief, it's that um, their grief is necessarily hidden. Nevertheless, Orestes thinks that he can tell the difference because Elector's grief shows. Now, that's the more or less the beginning of the scene. Then Electra finds his hair and his footprints. If you look at line six through seven, at the um, second page of the play on 132, a lock for Anakas in payment for my nurture and the second lock in token of my mourning. So there are two locks of hair and she attributes to them two different meanings. She'll treat them as though they're one. Still, she gives them two different meanings. So Electra takes hair and footprints as a kind of proof. But we need to see that what she really does is make an inference. The hair itself tells her nothing. By itself, it's just a dumb fact. And that's emphasized by Aeschylus because he, tells, uh, he shows us that there are at least two possible meanings to it. And she draws two possible conclusions. So he alerts us to the ambiguity of the dumb fact by initially having her draw the wrong conclusion. What does she conclude? Well, the locks of hair are here, therefore Orestes must have sent them, therefore he's not here. And the, by implication, um, she, she seems to think that he's afraid to come. So the dumb fact is there, and, she, and she, she gets it wrong, what its significance is. Now, the recognition scene is so problematic because Electra builds a scenario around evidence that itself presupposes a scenario. And of course, ultimately, she accepts Orestes as her brother, not because he is transparently her brother. When she looks at him, she doesn't recognize him. Strange, you know, we had, our hair is identical, our feet is identical, but apparently our eyes, nose, and mouth aren't. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't notice him and say, oh, this must be Orestes, because to be alike is to be, or to be akin is to be. But she accepts him because of a sign, the, the embroidery. Um, so what is strange is the way we assume the existence of experience that is utterly unambiguous as a ground for recognition. The question, of course, is whether any such experience is even possible. Does Clytemnestra recognize Orestes? She only recognize, recognizes Orestes when she hears about the death of Aegisthus. She, she doesn't, it, she, she talks to him before then and doesn't assume that he's her son. So the presence of Orestes' hair on Agamemnon's tomb seems significant. Someone who holds Agamemnon dear has come. That's the conclusion one might draw. Although one wouldn't have to draw it. It could be a ruse. It could be a feint of some sort. Um, the problem is that ultimately the hair on the tomb doesn't mean anything unless you supply a story. The story that you supply is the plotting that we spoke of last week, 
In other words, the sequence of events that gets it on the tomb. Okay, let's jump now. I want to look at um, Orestes' account of Apollo's oracle, which begins, with, we'll look at the passage on 145 following. This is lines 269 to 296. Orestes, I think I'll read all of it. Bottom of 145. Never shall I be betrayed by Loxias's, that's Apollo's, mighty oracle, which commands me, I'll change the translation a little bit, to risk this trial, raising many a loud cry and naming chilly plagues to freeze my warm heart. Should I not take advantage uh, on those, uh, I'm sorry, not take vengeance on those responsible for, responsible for the father after the same fashion, um, saying to take life for life, driven to fury by the grievous loss of my possessions, and with my own dear life, or my own dear soul, uh, he said, I should pay the, this debt, enduring many loathsome ills. For as he revealed to mortals the means of mollifying malignant powers of earth, he spoke naming these plagues, leprous ulcers that mount upon the flesh with cruel fangs, eating away its primal nature, and a white down sprouting forth upon this infection. He spoke of other assaults of the Irinis, brought about by the shedding of my father's blood. And then a, there's a lacuna after that. Seeing clear, though the dark, he directs his glance, though in the dark, he directs his glance. For the dark arrows of the infernal powers darted by kindred fallen who call for vengeance, and madness and vain midnight fears harass and torment and uh, drive him from the city, his body maimed by the brazen scourge. And such men may have no part in the festal bowl or in the pouring of drink offering. Both are kept far from the altars by their father's unseen wrath, and none may receive nor entertain such a one, but he must perish at last, honorless and friendless, cruelly shriveled by a death that wastes him utterly away. Now, We saw this last time. We started to see this. Um, it's actually not clear that Apollo told him to kill his mother. That comes out also if you look at line 1030 following. He told Orestes what would happen to him if he didn't kill his mother. And Orestes clearly interprets this to mean that Apollo wants him to kill Clytemnestra. So he interprets leprosy as punishment. By itself, of course, it's just an illness. It's not a punishment. It needs to be placed in the context of a story to be interpreted as punishment. Now, the sign of what's going on here is that up through line 284, everything in Orestes' account is in what's called indirect statement. Apollo said that, this, X, Y, and Z. Um, this is, of course, in its, it, this, of course, in itself leaves it open and very unclear whether Apollo actually said the words that Orestes uses or whether these words are an interpretation. I mean, when we say, you know, well, what are you going to do? Well, I was told that I have to X, Y, and Z. That, that's your way of recounting what you were told to do by someone in authority, but it may not be it, exactly what was said. It, it, it may be, it, it may bear the brunt, bear the, the imprint of your interpretation. But at 285, line 285 following, we get direct statement. This seems to be 
Orestes speaking in his own name. So what does he say? He says, if I don't kill her, the deed, the dead rather, will punish me with guilt. So this is in a way really the only punishment, strictly speaking, that Orestes suffers. It's not the dumb facts, the events themselves, but the interpretation he places on them. It's their significance in his story. So we have the, I mean, that in a way has something to do with the importance of the, of the Furies, the Irines, um, in this play and in the next play. Um, you could put the problem this way. I think we've, I may have talked about this before, but you put the problem in this way. Um, if you think about the way the law works, someone commits an infraction, um, there's a charge brought, there's a trial, and then a verdict is rendered, either guilty or innocent. If guilty, then the person, then a punishment is prescribed. Now, this doubleness of the word guilt, that it, on the one hand it refers to something I feel, and on the other hand, it's something that a jury determines that I am. Um, it's not an accident that these two words are the same word, because you could say that ideally the goal of a legal system is that the guilty should feel guilty. Um, but the difficulty is that um, it's not like, I mean, it's not like hitting, it, it, um, feeling guilty is sort of, guilty is a sort of adverb, right? I, so if I hit hard, then I am hit hard. It looks as though the hard transfer, but it doesn't work that way with guilt. The fact that I think you're guilty and punish you and expect doesn't mean that you will feel on the other end of it guilty. You may just be resentful or angry or um, indifferent because you expected something. You don't feel guilt. In it. And so the problem is that it's very hard to understand what you can do to someone to guarantee that they will interpret the punishment in the appropriate way. Punishment is a weird sort of thing. It doesn't actually work and perform the function it's supposed to perform unless it's interpreted correctly. And what we're getting in the libation bearers is an exposing of this fact that, that events by themselves, we jump very quickly to the notion that the events have a kind of significance but it's not clear that pulled out of the story in which they're embedded that they have the kind of significance that we want them to have. Um, let's jump again to our third passage. Um, if we look at the first stasimon, the first corollode, goes from 585 to 651, um, the chorus give us examples of what are supposed to be crimes originating in female eros. Um, it's interesting. Uh, that doesn't come out as clearly in your translation that eros is the issue because I think he has multiple translations for it. But if you look on 165 at the antistrophe number one, it runs like this. But of the hyper daring thoughts of a man who could say, or of the desperate eroses, erotas, of women all daring, fellows of the spirits that wreak ruin among mortals, um, unions in wedlock are perverted by the victory of shameless eros, mastering the female among beasts and men. So they start their, their chorus with, it looks as though they're going to make an argument. They're going to make an argument against Clytemnestra, ultimately, 
that she deserves to be punished. She's committed a crime. The crime that she's committed has to do with this daring erotic, erotic passion that has moved her. What's interesting is that well, then we get a series of examples that are supposed to bear this out. Examples from, um, from uh, the Greek mythology. So if you look at the next passage, we won't do this for all of them, but for this one, let's do it. Let any know this whose wits have not flown off. Any, let any know this, whose wits have not flown off, having learned of the plot which the killer of her son uh, Thestius, a uh, wretched daughter, accomplished, a plot of burning in the fire, she who consumed in flames the charred brand assigned to her son, that was his fellow in age, from the cry he uttered when he left his mother's womb and remained coeval throughout life to the day determined by fate. Now, you really need Lloyd-Jones's note for this on the previous page, unless you know the story. Um, Althea, daughter of Thestius, was wife of Aeneas, a king of uh, uh, Caledon, and mother of the great hero Meleager. Soon after Meleager's birth, it was predicted that he would not survive longer than a brand then burning on the fire, and Althea seized the brand and kept it carefully. After Meleager, with other heroes, had slain the great boar sent by Artemis to ravage the crops of Caledon, he gave the spoils to the virgin huntress, Atalanta. In consequence, a quarrel started in which Meleager killed his mother's two brothers. Althea, in fury, took the brand and hurled it on the fire, and Meleager's death followed. The story is the subject of Swinburne's Atalanta and Caledon. You need to know that, but what's interesting is nothing to do with Eros. So it's an interesting story about a mother who kills her kid um, uh, to avenge the murder, his murder of her brothers, but it doesn't have anything to do with Eros. And the next example, uh, you get Scylla, killed, who killed her father, Nisus, king of Megara, when he was at war with Minos, the king of Crete. Now, true, she did it for love of Minos, but the war was supposed to be a just war. Um, then, line 623, you get an allusion to Clytemnestra, um, but without any mention whatsoever of Iphigenia. Um, so it makes her crime look as though it's utterly owing to her, uh, her love of Aegisthus. Uh, and then um, in, the, in the final example, uh, they give no account whatsoever of why it is that the Lemnian women killed their husbands. Um, it was for bringing home uh, Thracian slave women, but the women on Lemnos were, were beset by something called the Lemnian, in Greek, kaka, which means bad things, but um, it, they, for some reason, had a terrible smell, and the, and the men couldn't uh, bear it, and so went off to Thrace and uh, brought home some Thracian women. Now, um, the chorus here claim that the link of all of these uh, examples, which they're not too specific about, um, the examples themselves, they claim that Eros is the link. Um, but they never get to it. They never tell you, I mean, they give you details, but they don't give you the details that show that the, um, that the issue is erotic. Um, they, instead, they, they veer away from it and treat um, instead actions that are not necessarily actions committed out of passion. So you could put it this way. They give you the bottom line, X killed Y, but they omit all the plotting, the details, the stories. The stories they allude to suit them, suit their purpose, only because they omit the details. The minute they put the details in, they look problematic. Now, an interesting 
detail, um, this whole scene is followed immediately by the lines that I um, uh, called your attention to last time, line 651, where Orestes goes to the door and knocks and says, boy, boy. Now, in Greek, that would be pi, pi. That's what it is. Um, the turning point of the play is where slaves become crucial to the action. The, la the language flattens out, and the scene borders on comedy. Um, that's like a punctuation. That's an audible punctuation, end of sentence. Uh, now, it's very interesting, by the way, that pi, pi, looks like this in Greek. Oh, I need my own. So this is the beginning of the second part of the play. Boy, boy, if you turn to the Agamemnon, turn back to the Agamemnon, 11, line 11, 14, it's on page 89. Cassandra, the chorus have just said, I do not yet understand, for now her riddles leave me perplexed at her obscure oracles. And then she says, ah, ah, alas, alas, what is, it, what is this that comes into view? And she begins to talk about the murder of Agamemnon. But the, actually in the Greek, the ah, ah is papai. So there's, they're very close, and the, the comic emerges in an expression that looks like a, a, a modification of an expression which is just one of the ways that you wail in Greek tragedy. Um, on to the fourth. We'll come back and see how they're connected. Uh, Look at line 973 following. Is it 973? Let me see. The last scene. This is bottom of 187. Look upon the two tyrants of the land, the spoilers of my house who killed my father. Majestic semnoi, it's a word that will be used of the humanities when they be, the Furies when they become humanities in the last play. Majestic were they then seated upon their thrones and dear to each other even now, as we may read by the fate they have suffered and their covenant abides by its sworn terms. Together they swore death for my unhappy father and together they swore to die and they have kept their oath. Look also you who hear these evils on the device they use to bind my unhappy father, their manacles for his hands and fetters for his feet, spread it out, stand by in a circle, and display her covering for her husband, that the father may behold, and not my father, but he who looks upon this whole world, the son, may behold my mother's unholy work, so that he may bear me witness in the trial, the decaying when it comes, that it was with justice, DK, that I pursued this killing. That of my mother, for Aegisthus' death, I count for nothing. He has suffered the adulter really the, the dishonorer's penalty, or DK, justice, as is the law. Now, if you look at the lines at the side, you'll see that they jump from 990 to 997, and you get a note where Lloyd-Jones says the transposition adopted, transposition adopted in the text was suggested only during the present century, but it removes more than one serious difficulty better than other suggested expedients. So he shifted one passage, and the assumption is that some scribe miscopied it. I'm going to move it back, and I'll, I hope I can show you why um, before we're finished. So after line 990, he has suffered the dishonorer's decay as is the law, but she 
who devised this hateful deed against her husband, whose children she had borne beneath her girdle, a burden once dear but now of deadly hatred, as the sight of her reveals, what think you of her? Had she been a sea snake or a viper, would not her very touch have had the power to rot another yet unbidden? Such was her shamelessness and her evil uh, thought. Um, a trap for a wild beast or draped over the dead... Uh, what, what am I to name... I'm sorry. What, am I to, what name am I to give this? Speak I never so fair. A trap for a wild beast or draped over the dead man's feet, the draping of a coffin. No, a net, a hunting net, you might call it, or a robe to entangle a man's feet. Such a possession might some brigand set, a cheater of travels who plays a robber's trade, and with this cunning snare might he slay a man and much delight his heart thereby. Now, um, let's just finish it up. May I never have such a mate um, to share my house sooner than that. May the gods make me perish childless. He, Orestes displays the net or the robe or whatever it is that Agamemnon was caught in as though it were itself self-explanatory. Behold the bloody cloth. See how much she deserved to die. That's his argument, right? Um, we know that he's doing something like that and that, that Aeschylus is doing something like that because the reason I rearranged or put it back in the original order is this. Um, at 991 following, he starts by comparing her to uh, a snake. He says, uh, but she who devised this hateful deed against her husband, whose ch children she had borne beneath her girdle, burden once dear, but now of deadly hatred as the sight of her reveals. What do you think of her? Had she been a sea snake or a viper, would not her very touch have had the power to rot another, yet unbidden? Such was her shameless and evil pride. So you get that. And then the next line, if we go back up, what name am I to give this? Except in Greek, it's um, so what am I to call or to say of nin? OK? That's a pronoun. But it's a pronoun in Greek that can mean either he, she, or it. So at a crucial moment, so the reason Lloyd-Jones wants to change the order is that there seems to be a kind of disconnect. He gives a long account of Clytemnestra and says, she's such a snake. And then he points and says, what? Am I to call it or her? So he's made it clear that, I mean, the, the point, remember the point about ambiguity being something that you take advantage of, not something you try and do away with. It means in this context, either it, namely the net, or her, namely Clytemnestra, it's a beautiful bit of poetry because Aeschylus, at the very moment, when Orestes is making a case that the piece of evidence speaks for itself, he uses a word that can mean either it, the bloody cloth, or her, you could say, the, the soul of Clytemnestra. He's 
in the poetry itself, he's slid from one to the other. He's made an easy slide because it's the same word and thereby called your attention to the fact that the slide isn't really warranted. So, so you put it in this way to say the same thing. Nin is a third person pronoun. Him, her, it. So he's just been talking about Clytemnestra. And so the most natural way to take it here is her. Um, but it then becomes clear that he's made a transition. He's not talking about her anymore. He's talking about the cloak or the net or the robe. And so it seems to mean it. The ambiguity is perfect for the speech since it points to the problem of the speech. Orestes' speech is meant to say something like this. I will show you Clytemnestra's guilt. I will show you Clytemnestra's soul. And then he points to the cloak and he says, look at it. And he means look at her because he's treating it as though it makes her guilt immediately manifest to everybody. But of course the problem, go back to the other things, the way the play started, um, the hair didn't say unambiguously anything. And the cloak also says, doesn't say unambiguously anything. In order for it to mean something, it requires an interpretation, a story, which when you look at the passage, you see is precisely what Orestes proceeds to give it. He tells us, such a possession might some brigand set, a cheater of travels who plays a robber's trade, and with this cunning snare might he slay many a man and much delight his heart thereby. So you've got a blo bloody robe, and Orestes says, look at it. See how guilty she is? Why? Well, it's just the sort of thing that some brigand would, and then he elaborates on it. So it seems plausible at first, but then you realize that what you have in front of you is just, you know, sort of like a towel. Orestes is working backwards. The thing by itself isn't particularly awful, so he needs to develop a story that makes it awful so that it can be a manifestation of Clytemnestra's guilt. Now, you know that Aeschylus has this in mind because he repeats this whole ambiguity just a few pages later, one page later on 190 when he says, and the blood that gushed forth was time's partner in spoiling the many dyes applied to the embroidery. Now do I speak his eulogy? Now am I here to render auton, him or it, do lamentations. So he's once again used an ambiguity in the language to make it clear that he's being unclear about what it is, Orestes is being unclear about what it is that he's pointing to. So he's just spoken of the precious thing, and then he moves to his father. OK, so we've got these four different places in the text. Um, scenes, what do they point to? In every case, the meaning of a thing is taken to be self-evident and so gets taken for granted. But it turns out that they always involve concealed influences, stories, plots, or put it differently. Um, by itself, Orestes' hair, leprosy, the bloody cloak are meaningless. They only have meaning when they're embedded in a sequence of events, of actions. And even that turns out to be problematic. It would be more correct to say that we try to give them meaning by embedding them in a sequence of events. In this way, they become 
representations of what we can never get at in itself, the soul. So Orestes needs to display Clytemnestra's soul to the chorus so that they can see her guilt. But all they get is a bloody cloth. Um, and to make it significant, he has to put it in the story. But the attempt was originally to use the cloth to make sense of the events. So the movement is from events to symbolic representation to story. So things are significant or meaningful only insofar as they're significant or meaningful for a soul. And for that reason, to get at their significance is in a way to get at the soul for whom they're significant. It's Orestes' interpretation of the necessity, uh, of the possibility of leprosy that is his real punishment. Now, why is it so important to get inside the soul in this way? Well, only if you can do that is any assessment of justice possible. Because what you're talking about is motive. But the rub is that while stories are necessary in order to give things meaning, too many details overdetermine things. You want a story that is in some sense paradigmatic. So, for example, Hor Horace in the Art of Poetry um, suggests that the essence of poetry is lying. Hesiod, the Greek epic poet, um, in a book called The Theogony, um, tells us that the, the muses lie like the truth. It looks as though Hesiod and Horace, both of whom are poets, um, think that poetry makes a whole by cutting things out. Too much detail, too much reality destroys meaning by introducing accidental attributes. Now, that's what the slaves point to in the libation bearers. That's what Pi, Pi points to, to what in a way distinguishes comedy from tragedy. If somebody's name is Oedipus in a tragedy, and the etymology of Oedipus is swellfoot, um, or if somebody's name is Antigone, and the etymology of Antigone is anti-birth, that's, that's going to be significant. If somebody's name is Prometheus and it means forethought, that's going to be significant. If somebody's name is Willie Lowman, that's going to, it, in a tragedy, that's going to be significant. Uh, on the one hand, too much detail gets in the way of significance. On the other hand, too little detail takes things out of any context in which they can have a meaning. So you could say, in the libation bearers, there are really two extremes. Clytemnestra is the mother, mother as such. The nurse is the particular mother. So when Clytemnestra at the end tries to get Orestes not to kill her and suggests that she nursed him, you've already heard the nurse talk about having nursed him and you sort of wonder whether Clytemnestra really had very much to do with him at all as a child. So she's the mother, the paradigmatic mother, but then you have that, that almost comic speech by the nurse where she lets you know that she's the one who bathed him and changed his diapers and fed him and didn't know whether he was hungry. When babies cry, she says, you don't know whether they're hungry or they're wet or they're whatever they are. So she goes into all this elaborate, um, this elaborate detail, whereas in Clytemnestra, the issue is simplified because um, it's not 
whether she was an attentive mother or a good mother, it's, it's I bore him and metaphorically, I nursed him. But she draws the line apparently at changing his diapers. So you get Clytemnestra on the one hand, you get the nurse on the other, or put the whole thing differently. The male principle, meaning as such, without any particulars, and the female principle, particularity, the mother. The male principle, mathos. The female principle, pathos. The tragic principle, pathe mathos, learning through suffering, learning through the particular. The libation bearer shows us that you can't do without the particular details, not because it's opposed to meaning, but because there's no possible meaning without the particular details. OK, so what have we got? Why does Orestes go crazy? What does it mean that he goes crazy? He's confronted with something only he can see. He's punished by his perception of something as a punishment. He's not punished by leprosy or pain. He's punished by whatever it is that makes him think of leprosy and pain as punishments and not simply misfortunes. So we put the whole thing somewhat differently. The libation bears reveals to us the tendency that human beings have to see things as significant. Electra runs into hair on the, um, on the, uh, the tomb and she feels compelled to give an account of it. We then see that it's really only by placing these things in a story, in a context, relative to a soul or souls, that they really have meaning. But this makes these real things essentially symbolic. So put it this way. Um, family members die, we see people cry. Then we take crying to be a sign of the state of their soul. Then we prescribe crying at funerals so that people understand their own sadness as a kind of internal crying. Something like that transformation is what's happening in the libation bearers. Now, it makes us particularly interested in what it means that the Furies should become visible to everybody in the humanities and that this issue emerges in the context of um, the founding of the Athenian legal system. Um, but let's, before we get there, I mean, that's where we'll sort of start next time. Let's just go back to this simple thing that um, you notice you felt that, right? You've gone to funerals probably, one at least, something like a funeral in your lives. Um, you don't know how to behave. There are certain rituals that are 
laid out for you. Thank God, because if you didn't have the rituals, you wouldn't know what to do. You know, you, you, you can be so utterly shocked by the whole thing that, I mean, I've known people who burst into hysterical laughter when they hear of a, of a death. It's not that they think it's funny, it's that it so shocks them that they do this, this shocking thing. But, it, and the easiest thing in the world is to look at them and look at them and say, you know, you really should be crying. Don't you want to cry now? <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is that you, something's going on inside. It has an external manifestation. Or take, um, there's a, an interesting fact. Forget about the rest of it. Um, the Greek word phobos, which in, by Plato's, by their time, by the time of tragedy, means fear, um, in Homer means flight, running away. So it's an interesting fact about the language that a word that once meant to run away comes to mean to be afraid. Um, why? I mean, this is a version of my Woody Allen example, right? I mean, why? Because one of the things people do often when they're really terrified is run away. So then what happens? So you, you, you know that. You know that in yourself or you've watched other people do it. And it becomes an external, understood as an external expression of something that's going on that's very powerful in you. And then the poets will turn internal fear into, and not just the poets, happens in your dreams all the time, doesn't it? You're, you feel afraid and you end up running because the, 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 the physical manifestation, the external manifestation is the way you're able to articulate for yourself something that otherwise looks to be inarticulable, but it's what's moving you. So something like that is the issue of the libation bearers where Orestes has in front of, he wants them to understand why he killed her. He has to, in order to, for them to understand why he killed her, they've got to understand what a terrible person she was. But in order to understand what a terrible person she was, he has to explain in some way what's going on in her soul. That's what makes you a terrible person. What, that it's not the actual event. It's, it's um, maybe, maybe not the case that nothing's good or bad, but thinking makes it so. But maybe it actually is the case. It, it's not a statement of the arbitrariness of the good and the bad. It's rather a statement of the fact that the location of goodness and badness has to do with souls. You could say, I mean, if there wouldn't be any good and evil in the world if there were no souls in the world. There'd be a lot of motion maybe and stuff moving around, but there, you, well, nothing would be good or bad or beautiful or ugly. So it's the existence of souls that make it possible for certain things to be good, certain things to be bad. It's also rather interesting when you think about it for a minute um, that now I'm really just winging it, but it, it is true that um, when we, it is a remarkable thing about the world that when we perceive it, we don't perceive it. I mean, you know, if you listen to certain of the sort of empirical philosophers, they'll make you think that you, you perceive the world first as a series of sense data, objects of sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, and so on. But the really interesting thing about the way we orient ourselves in the world is this strange fact that as soon as we take stuff in, we're ranking it. You, you, it's better and worse, it's beautiful, it's less beautiful, it's a it, there are all these, these systems of ranking that have to do with the way we take things in. We don't take things in as, we take things in, in in this ranked way because that's what souls do. Now, what's interesting about that 
in, light, in, in terms of the libation bearers is that it points to the fact that if Orestes wishes to defend his own action, he has to show what was bad about Clytemestra, what was really awful about her, and he has to make that apparent to them, and it looks as though um, he thinks that he can do that by showing them an object. Um, now, we look on from the outside after, you know, reading and not even just hear, not even just hearing or seeing, but reading the play, and we say, oh, that's kind of silly. But in fact, it's not silly, it's what we all do all the time. We're compelled to do it. It has something to do with where we started uh, when we started when we talked about the connection between justice and likeness, decaying and decay. Um, it turns out that justice has built into it the need to make likenesses because there's no account of the just and the unjust without an account of what's going on inside. And what's going on in, and, and the inside is accessible to us only by way of these likenesses. There's no direct access to it. They have to downplay Iphigenia, and we see that in the play. Orestes makes, um, uh, when he charges Clytemnestra with a crime, he charges her with a, a adultery. He doesn't even mention um, the problem of the question of Iphigenia. So, um, so the question is, why do they? do that. Um, now, it's interesting that on the one hand, you can look at it the way you looked at it and should. On the other hand, you have to also realize that the motive of Clytemnestra is dark because she's over-determined. She could have done it out of um, love of Aegisthus. She could have done it out of vengeance for Iphigenia. She could have done it in order to remain in power. Um, all sorts of motives that she have has. So it, the question is why they ignore the least, why they ignore the one motive that looks, at, looks as though it might justify her deed. Um, now, it's not clear that, that Electra does ignore it. Because while she wants the death of her father to be avenged, it is never clear in anything that she says that she expects Orestes to be the avenger. And she disappears from the play before anything happens. So we want to bracket her and leave her out of it and ask the question about Orestes, um, it makes it easier because he's male and Agamemnon's male and because he should, he would be ruling, might be ruling in Argos if, um, uh, if Aegisthus and Clytemnestra hadn't killed his father. He would have the hope of being, being the ruler where it looks as though now he thinks he doesn't have the hope, so that he's overdetermined also, and that's mentioned in in the libation bearers. So it's his um, right to be to regain his property is mentioned early on. Um, so, um, so the question then is, why is Orestes so intent on? Um, on ignoring the possible motive that Clytemnestra has that might justify what she's doing. And we, of course, are also aware of the fact that Orestes thinks that he's been told to do what he's doing by a god in the same way that 
Agamemnon presumably thought he was told to kill his daughter by a god, right? Um, so it looks as though there's something in Clytemnestra that wants to tell Agamemnon, I don't give a crap about your gods. She's my daughter. And that bond between mother and child is so powerful that nothing overcomes it on the one hand. Um, and it looks as though the male in both instances wants to say, no, there is something that overrides the connection between kin and neutralizes it. And in both instances, it's an Olympian god telling you what to do. Now that in the, in the, um, in the third play, in the Eumenides, is going to turn into the city. The universal principles grounded in political life overrule the particularity that seems to be the, the, the domain of the family. Now, this is so complicated because, in fact, um, it's not a, I mean, what you learn from, from the, the, the distinction between the nurse and Clytemnestra in, um, in the second half of this play is that insofar as Clytemnestra emerges as the mother in principle, as opposed to the messier version of the nurse who did what mothers do and sort of has a real affection for Orestes that's born from a very particular attachment, it turns out to be the case that Clytemnestra is a symbolic representation of motherhood. But a symbolic representation of motherhood is already a universal pr uh, a principle about the particular. It looks as though it's a quasi-political principle. Therefore, what do we hear about uh, Clytemnestra? The very first thing that's said of her by the, the guard on the roof, the manly heart of Clytemnestra. So male and female are standing in here for two tendencies, neither one of which ever has the kind of purity that it pretends to have. But nevertheless, as tendencies, they are meant to characterize the human. And um, it, what, what the libation bearer shows you in a way is that you think that you have, on the one hand, um, meaning, significance, universality, and on the other hand, particularity, passion. That's why they go after Clytemnestra for being, you know, throwing her in among these examples who are supposed to be moved by erotic passion. It looks as though, it looks as though they're doing something we're quite familiar with, but Aeschylus is so much shrewder than that. Aeschylus means to show you that, in fact, the meaning that is supposed to emerge, that Orestes pretends emerges, in fact, is absolutely linked with particularity. It can't be severed from it. And it's always, in, that's a sign of its perennial incompleteness. That, so there is a way in which, I'm jumping here. You have to fill in the blanks yourself. But, and the blanks are interesting. But you could say, as a thing about poetry, he's thinking about the importance and power of poetry which is not particular and it's not universal. It wouldn't be what it is. I mean, any poem which is utterly particular and is only about, you know, if somebody writes a poem and says, uh, even if it's first person singular, even if it's a lyric poem describing my experience, I was on a beach on Cape Cod, and the waves came in, and I felt, and so on and so forth. Well, it's just about me. Who cares? It's only about, it's only if the I that's expressing itself is in some way paradigmatic. If you can pick up the poem and in some way learn something, not just about me, because what do you care about me? So poetry is what it is only because it's more than particular, but you would be foolish not to see that it always works through particulars. It can't, it, it doesn't, it, otherwise it would be a philosophical argument. 
So it turns out that you have on the one hand the pure particular, which doesn't exist, and if it did exist, would be utterly meaningless. And you have the pure universal. It's what people who are in philosophy frequently think they do. And Aeschylus is smart enough to see that neither one of those is actually possible and neither one of those actually is significant. Significance requires this uneasy connection between the two. And in particular, the issue about which the Oresteia is concerned, decay, justice, is absolutely and necessarily linked in some way to decaying, like or as. They give you examples which, if they spelled out the details, it would be clear that either Eros wasn't involved at all, the Meleager example seems to be like that, or if Eros was involved, there are all sorts of other extenuating circumstances. The details would make it less clear. So they don't give you the details, they just say, Eros rules, and I'll give you a whole bunch of examples where women killed kin. And the consequence of, and, and Eros was operating at every stage. And in fact, it's either not true or incompletely true. And as soon as you provide the details, you learn that it's not true or incompletely true. Yeah, that's very interesting. And so if I were to pursue it, I guess I would ask myself this. Um, is Aeschylus, I mean, apart from the previous reference to Clymenes' dream, he, he, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have to go much further than to see that he's just trying to show that she's bad, right? Um, but then you move, but then you add details the details from Aeschylus's poem, and it turns out that he's used this image previously, and it was Clytemnestra's dream. So it looks as though, almost despite himself, Orestes has, so let's look at it this way. The original dream, Clytemnestra wakes up, she's been bitten by a snake that was nursing at her breast. Um, she has a strange interpretation according to which that's Agamemnon. Orestes comes along and says, that's crazy, that's me. Um, he later likens her to a snake. And so the question is, could we think it through in such a way as to see that without realizing it, Orestes is opening up the possibility that Clytemnestra is the source of her own bad dreams. If she's the source of her own bad dreams, it begins to look very much like what we've seen in a different way, that Orestes' real punishment is not leprosy, it's not any of these things that are supposed to happen to him, it's how he responds to the things that if he feels guilty because he gets leprosy, his response to the leprosy is his genuine punishment. And it, without, without um, knowing it, it looks as though he suggested something like that for Clytemnestra as well. That's where I'd start. I'm, I'm not sure that how far it would take you, but that looks interesting to me. <laughs> 